Okay, hello everybody, and welcome. So if you have arrived in this room, you have already chosen your own adventure because this is a multi-track conference, and you had many other places you could be, so welcome. Um, I'm going to start off by turning on my clicker and then asking you about these books. Has anybody in this room ever seen these books or read them? Raise your hands. It's like a couple. Okay, cool. So I loved these books when I was a kid, and they're called the Choose Your Own Adventure series. And the basic premise is this. Each one of them has a theme. So in one of them, you might be a kid helping your uncle who's an Egyptian archaeologist. In another one, you might be trying to help recover lost jewels. And the reason that I love these books is because they were like a regular book, right? There was some narrative, some storyline. But then at the bottom, you had options. So in this one, this is an extract from The Lost Jewels of Nabuti. Option A is if you want to go on tomorrow's plane to Paris, you can go to the next page. Option B is if you need more help, more information, extra time, turn to page nine. Um, this seems very software related because I think we all have a software project in the past where we would have liked to go to page nine because we needed more time, information, and extra help. But depending on which path that you chose, um, you would then go to more pages and they would have more paths. You're thinking, this sounds very, yeah, yes. It was a directed acyclic graph in narrative format. Um, and so this is actually a kind of cool way to teach data structures to children, which is not what this talk is about. Uh, but what was cool about this was that you would, be, uh, you would go through this book and there would be several endings, which are the leaf notes here. And uh, you know, as a kid, you would try to find out how to go back to other endings without going all the way back to the top. And the, the designers of these books got really tricky sometimes. Like Sometimes they had unconnected notes, so they were like endings that you couldn't actually get to through any path. You had to just end up there by making a mistake or by being an original thinker or something. Um, and also, the endings that were hidden were often the good ones. <laughs> so anyway. But as I started to get older, I began to think about this. I was like, sometimes life seems a bit like a choose-your-own-adventure book. I have options, but who is making up these options? And do I have to pick one of them? Is there something else I could choose? So who am I? Uh, my name is Nabila. To fit in with the retro theme, here's a kid photo of me that's like a uh, computer running MS-DOS with like a dot matrix printer, if you're into vintage things. but. Um, I currently work as an engineer at Microsoft, and for the past eight years or so, I've worked at a variety of uh, startups and larger companies as an engineer and as a lead and also as a consultant. And one of the things about me and what I love doing is traveling. So I work at Microsoft, but at the northernmost Microsoft office in the world, which is 1,500 kilometers north of here, uh, in the extremely beautiful north of Norway. I highly recommend you check it out. It's pretty cool over there, literally. <laughs> Somebody laughed. <laughs> but yeah, for those of you who have traveled a lot, uh, you probably have uh, discovered one thing in that sometimes you go to another country and you're just like, why are people doing things this way? We don't do this back home. And maybe you ask somebody, like, why are you doing it like this? And they, they're like, this is just the way we've always done it. Or they you know, say, well, there was a reason for it, but that was like 50 years ago. And so for me, I'm really interested in this question. In the past 10 years, I've lived and worked in five different countries, and I love traveling. And a lot of you have probably had this experience as well when you've traveled. And so in the words of Steve Jobs, that life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact, that everything around you that, people, that, you, uh, everything around you, that you call life was made up by people that are no smarter than you. And you can change it. You can influence it. And so this is going to be a journey of asking why. And in that why, to try and define our own paths. So let's talk about choosing your own career. Um, here's choose your own adventure number one. And we're going to go through this in a series of choose your own adventure book-like steps. So this is how I felt when I graduated from university years ago. Congratulations, you have now graduated from your engineering degree at university. If you would like to have an office job working as a programmer, go to the next page. Um, and I kind of felt like I, that was basically my choice. And a lot of you in this room, you might have engineering degrees, you might not have degrees, you might have degrees that are completely unrelated to anything you're doing now, and all of those paths are pretty cool. But now we're going to look at, at a guy. We're going to take stories during this presentation of people that have done things a little bit differently. So here's the setup. It's the summer in Ohio in the US, and a man, he's 30, feeling a little bit disillusioned. And he's like, you know, I feel like I can run my business from the road. I feel like I can, like, technology is sufficiently advanced that I don't need to be chained to one place. So he decides to sell his house, everything he owns, go on a road trip through America. And you're looking at me and you're saying, this is not particularly interesting to be like, 
I have my laptop in my backpack, I have the internet, I can get my work done. It's probably my primary machine. The difference is this was 1983. And this is Stephen K. Roberts. He wrote a book about his experience called Computing Through America. But he created this like modded bicycle. Uh, we're going to look at the tech specs of that in a bit. Uh, and he cycled around America and he actually managed to run his business. And this was 1983 and some people consider him the first uh, techno nomad. I think we would call it now a digital nomad. Uh, techno nomad sounds way cooler. Here's a picture of him on his laptop in a tent. <laughs> and now we're going to see a clip of him he, uh, when he was talking to CNN. He got a lot of press coverage about this thing that he Oops. built. The bicycle contains a number of computers which allow me to maintain a business while I travel. Five computers to be exact with 1.7 megabytes of memory and a battery-powered three and one half inch disk drive. A laptop for use when not moving and a keyboard built into the handlebar so he can write while riding. That's sort of like playing a flute. There are four buttons on each side and I simply type in binary. And if you think about the fact that you're using eight fingers, there are 256 possible combinations. I can do about 30 words a minute when I'm on a roll, so to speak. <laughs> so, I, let's show of hands if you would use a um, handlebar handlebar interface uh, to send messages while you were cycling. <laughs> okay, so I kind of get why that interface uh, never took off. <laughs> but the point is, um, what he did is now considered fairly common. Times are changing, right? Um, nobody really knows how many digital nomads there are. It's really hard to register yourself as one, and often people are working kind of under. Uh, under the legal status of the, of the country that they're in. Estonia might be a pioneer in introducing a digital nomad visa next year, which will allow people to live and work in the Schengen area for up to a year. So that's pretty cool. So, you know, obviously there are more options. Obviously you can get a job or you can cycle around America. But in all seriousness, I want to talk about the idea of a job before we get to the different paths that we have as tech workers. Because I started thinking about this, like what is a job? Um, why do we have them? Why do we work from Monday to Friday, 40 hours a week? And it surprised me, and it might surprise you to know as well, that these long-term corporate jobs that guarantee lifelong job security, they're a really recent innovation. We've really only seen them in the past 60 or 70 years. So where did that even come from? As you can see, I do like asking why a lot. So, the Industrial Revolution. In the 19th century, a lot of people were still craftsmen. They were bakers, blacksmiths, butchers. They, were, they had a skill. They were selling that skill for money. And then with the Industrial Revolution, we started having machinery. We started having assembly lines. We started having um, uh, factories where people needed to work. And as the machinery became increasingly complex, it became important for us to keep the staff that we trained. If you're going to invest in training somebody, you don't want them to leave. Um, in the 19th century, employee turnover uh, was as high as 300% in some of these factories. But as the machinery became more complex, it became more important to keep investing in your employees and to, to have them stay. And you know, this is a win-win relationship. For the employer, you have uh, loyal employees who will stay with you, who you can invest in training. For the employee, this was a win situation. You have some kind of stability. You have increasing wages over time. But things are changing. Uh, I want to take a like a survey of this room actually. Uh, how many of you uh, are currently in like a full-time job? You know, like you have one employer that pays most of your income. Okay, keep your hands up if you've been in that job for six months at least. Okay, keep your hands up if you've been in that job for one year, for two years, for three years, for four years, for five years, and look around the room. And uh, you guys are a statistic, <laughs> in a way. So in the US, if you talk to someone between the ages of 55 and 65, thank you, by the way, for putting your hands up. Uh, but if, you're be if you're between the ages of 55 and 65, your average job tenure has been 10 years. And now, for people between the ages of 25 and 35, the average job tenure is four years. And I think that mirrors a lot of our experience, right? It's really, um, people job hop a lot. And why is that? You know, a lot of it is because of this firm-specific job training. The tools that you use at work are probably the same as the tools I use at my work. We're probably using the same text editor. We're probably using the same frameworks. We're probably using the same open source libraries and the same languages. It's not that hard for you to pick up and go to a new project or a new company, right? And some people actually think that this is the future of work. Lawrence Katz, who's a Harvard labor economist, thinks that we're going to see a workforce that's a lot more like the artisans of the 19th century. And the really amazing thing about being a tech worker is we are there. We are on the cusp of this. Our jobs are inherently craftsmanlike. As you become more skilled technically, 
and in your communication, as you become more skilled, more opportunities are available to you and you have a depth of knowledge that makes you invaluable. And so it's a really exciting time. Some people, by the way, think the future of work is going to be very project focused. Um, so the Hollywood model, some people call it. You know, in Hollywood you have a bunch of people that you bring on for a specific project. You hire George Clooney and a bunch of lighting people and a bunch of filming people and then you make a movie and then you move on to the next thing after a couple of years. And people think that this might be the future of work. And this is a pretty exciting time. But even now, there's so many options with a tech career. Um, these are just a couple. Uh, and when I started, this whole landscape wasn't visible to me. And in my time, I've seen people move from being a developer. Hands up, actually, if you're a developer, if you would consider yourself a developer primarily. Okay, a lot of you. Yeah, in my time, I've seen people move from being a developer to developer advocacy, to QA, to PM, to design, to engineering management, to project management, to up and down the slack. It's becoming increasingly fluid how you can define your role and how you can shift into other roles. <clears throat> and uh, the other thing about this is that it's also becoming increasingly common to work remotely or to be able to negotiate at your job to work remotely. Um, here's another one where I'm going to poll the audience because I'm curious about this. So you are starting at a new job. You can choose one of the below. Which would you like to do? So hands up if you'd like to work in an open plan office. Uh, you can look around the room as well. Okay, hands up if you'd like to work in a cubicle. Okay. Is, wait, I think there's one person. Okay. Uh, hands up if you'd like to have a private office. That's pretty cool. Okay. And hands up if you'd like to work entirely remotely. Okay. This is really interesting. There's been a pretty decent spread between the open plan office, the private office, and working remotely. I met someone two weeks ago who works in an open plan office. He is so distracted by all the things at his work. Uh, the typing, the visual noise, all of this. And he was, say, he was wondering whether it would be a little too passive-aggressive if he used his company's hackathon to build himself a cubicle. <laughs> but uh, let's ask why about these offices. Um, this is a typical open plan office. This is Atlassian's office in San Francisco. But how do we get here? Well, in the 1950s, open plan offices were all the rage. It started with this concept of Bureau Landschaft. I got some German training just before this presentation. I, he, he says I did well. But anyway, <laughs> this idea of office landscaping. People were working in offices, and there was a hierarchy. You know, the better your office, the fancier you were. So the idea of office landscaping from the 1950s, from Germany, was that there would be an easy communication between people. There wouldn't be a hierarchy. It was going to revolutionize everything. And uh, this is uh, one of the charts. So on the left is uh, yeah, it's the left for you. On the left is a traditional office setup, and on the right was this revolutionary thing: open space, geometry, plants everywhere. But then by the 1960s, people were really frustrated. People that were used to working in open plan offices or, or in closed offices, they found it so noisy and so distracting to work in these open plan landscapes. So the cubicle, the cubicle was actually created to help save us from this, to give us back our autonomy and independence, to give us three walls that would give us privacy and would let us rearrange it to fit our working style. But then, of course, um, the <laughs> cubicle became a symbol of uh, big corporations and being a cog in the machine and a complete opposite of what it had attempted to do. And so this, for me, is a really cool example of asking why and thinking about the history of the decisions that we make. And on the topic of the decisions we make, here's choose your own adventure number three. You have been offered a new job with a fancier job title and a higher salary. Will you take it? Will you take it? I don't know. Raise your hand if you would take it. Depends, right? Yeah. So if you'd like to take it, you can turn to page 39. But if you would not, turn to page 12. When I started my career, I used to think that they were something like this, some kind of linear progression where I started off at the bottom and I became better and I don't know, it was basically like this. And at the end was, you know, fame, money and a yacht. Um, until the point where I realized uh, that I don't actually want a yacht. I don't even like boats that much. Sorry. No. And um, this is the thing. Is that A lot of what I was thinking about at that time when I was thinking of which was the next job to have was social approval. And we all want social approval. You're probably sitting in this room thinking, I wonder what the person in the chair next to me thinks of me. Like, we're all after social approval. We work really hard to get it, and then we try to keep it. And the problem with this is, as a driver for a career, this is not really a good idea. Because if we want social approval, then we need to have the same values as the people whose approval we're after. And we need to have the same definition of success as them. 
And constantly relying on external motivation doesn't really necessarily lead to a satisfying career, unless you're happy with you know, the values and the success of the people that you see. So we should really be asking, like, for those people whose admiration we're trying to, uh, trying to get, do we align with their vision of success? And is their vision of success something that's going to give us contentment, happiness, tranquility, whatever it is we want? I think a lot of interesting careers are more like this. They're more like squiggly lines with a bunch of points in the middle. And it's hard to say what the end is going to be because we don't know what the end is going to be. A lot of the jobs that we have now weren't even jobs 20 years ago. What is a social media influencer? That's not a thing that existed in the past. Uh, we have so many jobs uh, now, like being a, being a VR uh, developer or being a autonomous vehicle engineer, right? These are jobs that are really popular now that didn't really exist. See, the only thing we can optimize for is really the next step. And it's really hard, but it's really important to try and think about uh, what your values are, what your definition of success is, because it might not be aligned with other people. Uh, I, def I personally have taken jobs with lower salaries and with worse titles because they meant something to me and because they were something I was interested in. And a lot of people were like, like they didn't understand it, but that doesn't matter because they don't need to understand it. Because the dots of your life don't make sense all the time, but they will make sense in retrospect. And I like to look at a lot of interesting people here. This is Joey Ito. He is currently the director of the MIT Media Lab, which is one of the most progressive and pioneering research institutes in the world. And it might surprise you to know that he doesn't have any degrees. He runs a center full of people with PhDs, but he's a twice university dropout. And he actually spent his 20s DJing in nightclubs in Japan. But he talks about how those skills are being used in his current job. He says, I used to be a disc jockey. You take the sense of the room, you have a couple of different paths you can take, and you can make lower or higher energy by tuning the music you're playing. I can play the background music and roughly predict the trajectory people will take. I can't tell them what to do. So he talks about how he uses his disc jockey experience to uh, do social engineering in his uh, role as the director of the MIT Media Lab. And I think a lot of you are probably thinking, you probably have experiences in your own life. They didn't seem related to your career, but they affected your skill set and what you have now. And it's so important to choose your own priorities and not somebody else's. Here's another thing that I faced a lot when I started my career. You have a limited amount of energy each day. How would you like to spend it? If you would like to work on your coding side project after work, which by the way, there's no judgment in this slide, it's perfectly okay if you choose to do this, turn to page 42. But if you'd like to do other things in your life as well, you are not a real developer. I felt a lot of pressure of having to be a real developer. I felt like maybe if I didn't have a coding side project, then it meant I wasn't passionate enough, I didn't care enough. And these are all the things that we're always encouraged to do. And that, like, these are important things to do, right? To write blogs, to do side projects, to go to tech meetups, contribute to open source, keeping up with frameworks and language developments, continually learning everything across the stack. Maybe even coming to this conference has given you this whole bucket list of things that you need to read up about or do or achieve. And it's exhausting. We have this idea of this 10x programmer who's so much better. And these 10,000 hours that we need to achieve and by the way, these 10,000 hours were popularized by Malcolm Gladwell in his book Outliers. And they come actually from the research of Anders Ericsson, who's a Swedish uh, social scientist. And he studied violin players. And you might have heard this before. But he looked at violin players who were top performers, and he wanted to look at what made them so good. And so he found one thing about them, is that they practiced in the same way in the morning, in three increments of no more than 90 minutes each, with a break between each one. And the thing about this practice is it was deliberate practice. It was so effortful that you could really only do four and a half hours of it, at which point you had diminishing returns. And this applied for other people he looked at, chess players, athletes. And programming is inherently a creative pursuit. It's an effortful pursuit. You know how tired you feel after a day where you're concentrating, and you're doing that deliberate practice and trying to write the best code that you can. And burnout is a real thing. It's actually a real mental health issue, and we shouldn't take it lightly. In a study by Blind, a message board app that surveyed 11,000 employees at a bunch of top companies, they asked them one simple question. Are you suffering from burnout? Yes or no? 57% of people said yes. These are people at Microsoft, they're people at Amazon, at Google, at Reddit. <coughs> I called Reddit a top company just now. Yes. Um, and, the, and we kind of... I've been victim to this as well, like meeting someone at a party or at a conference even, and going, what do you do for a living? And in that way, like, kind of suggesting that you're defined by your job, by the thing that you do for money. But in actual fact, we are so much more, right? There are so many more things. There are mountains. Uh, this is a picture from North Norway, the North Norwegian Tourism, Tourism Board did not sponsor me. But have I mentioned it's exceptionally beautiful there? <laughs> but there are other interests, uh, other passions, other pursuits. 
And there are also, you know, children. Maybe you're a uh, parent, maybe you're a carer of people, maybe you're involved in volunteer and community efforts. All these things are so important. Ellen Ullman um, has been a programmer since 1978. She's seen through the personal computer revolution, the internet revolution, uh, and she says this uh, about people in Silicon Valley, that they want to change the world, but they work all the time. So what exactly do they know about the world outside the cloisters of venture capitalists and startups? And we've seen in the past couple of years that technology isn't unbiased. Like, we're not just building things in a vacuum. In this room, you guys probably work in all sorts of industry, healthcare, finance, retail, you know, the work that you do actually affects real people. And sometimes as an engineer, it's easy to say, this is my job, this is compartmentalized, I don't need to worry about the impact of what I'm building. But we see increasingly that you do. And in a way, being whole people and allowing ourselves to explore the other sides of ourselves lets us make a future that's diverse and inclusive. Here's an example of this. This is Donna Sarkar. She's currently head of the Windows Insider program, which is a program that lets people test and give feedback on pre-release builds of, Windows, uh, of Microsoft software. And as well as being an accomplished software engineer, she's also a fashion designer, which is a strange and interesting combination. But she says this. She wants people in the Insiders program to feel like part of the family. She wants them to feel like they have a seat at the table to help make the product better. And not just hardcore technical people. She wants people who work on creative projects to also feel like they have a seat at the table. And it's hard to say if she would really have that same perspective if she didn't have all these other interests. And so everything that you do feeds back into your work. So we're going to go on a different tangent. And this one is about money, which nobody wants to talk about and we don't teach at school at university. Has anyone ever had like a financial literacy or just anything about budgeting at any kind of school or university setting in their life? A couple. OK, that's really cool. Yeah, there's like 10 people in the room. But I didn't have this. And why don't we teach this? This is the single biggest enabler in letting you choose your own adventures. Um, things like budgeting, things like learning about debt, things like learning about investment, things like knowing what you're going to do with a paycheck, things like knowing what you'll do with a windfall, um, things like knowing about taxes. These are all learnable skills. And one of my biggest regrets is I didn't think about this early enough. Like, if you were working, you should be thinking about this already. Um, so. Sometimes it can seem scary and it can seem like you want to put it off because money is weird and we're kind of socialized not to talk about it sometimes. But it's learnable. So here's a choose your own adventure. You've just received a raise at work, increase your consulting rates. What will you do with the extra money? If you would like to increase your spending on consumer goods and services for a more luxurious lifestyle, turn to page 31. That sounds a little bit judgmental. But actually, I was playing recently The Sims Mobile. Please don't judge me for this fact. And I really enjoy the Sims series, but the Sims Mobile, you know how every game has this like one metric that you're trying to, uh, or maybe one or two metrics that you're trying to improve, like your level or your money or your experience or whatever, right? So the metric in the Sims Mobile is your lifestyle score. It's actually a measure of how nice your sofa is. Um, and so, you know, it's giving me advice here, like improve your lifestyle score by expanding your wardrobe, by buying home catalog items or collecting heirlooms. This sounds like a dystopian future, but this game takes itself very seriously. So let's look at alternatives to that. And uh, here is a software engineer, Peter Denny. He goes by the name of Mr. Money Mustache. And he also runs a blog uh, by the same name. I think he used to have a better mustache, which is why he was called Mr. Money Mustache. It's not completely evident in this picture. But he is one of the proponents of early retirement or financial independence. And he has a simple... Uh, basically a simple mantra. So he became financially independent at age 30. So what he means by that is basically his investment returns are enough to supply him with enough money to live. So he does not need to uh, necessarily uh, work for money, right? And the way he did this is super simple. Him and his wife were software engineers. They worked, uh, they saved over half their income. They lived a pretty simple life. Uh, they put that money into investments and that's literally everything. I've told you everything on his blog. But there are other ways to control our finances and to think about money and to think about what's important to us. So this just to say that just because it's the common narrative doesn't mean it needs to be our narrative. We can choose what we want to do. So more options than just the one that we saw before. And let's shift tangent a little bit more and talk about interactions. Here we go. You are sitting at a conference, and there are a couple of minutes before the next talk starts. 
what do you do? If you would like to pull out your phone and look busy, turn to page 69. If you would like to turn to the person next to you and introduce yourself, turn to page 10. Okay, hands up. Have you introduced yourself today to someone you didn't know at this conference? Okay, a couple. But still, some people that haven't. So, this is what we're going to do. You're going to turn to the person next to you, and it might be cheating because you might already know them because you might have come with a friend, but you're going to say hello, and maybe you're going to ask them what cool thing they're working on, or maybe you're going to ask them what their favorite color is, but you're going to have a conversation with them for two minutes, and then I'll bring you back. <laughs> Twenty minutes. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to bring you back. Cool. So I hope that you guys see. There are so many interesting conversations here. You don't want to stop talking. How fun it is to meet people. Um, I think some conference attenders often call this the hallway track. It's where you don't go to any of the talks and you just chat to people in the hallway that you've just met. Um, yes. um, here's also a thing that I love to do because I think everybody has something to teach you or something interesting to say. And I hope that you've learned something about the person you're sitting next to. But if you're at a conference, assume everybody you meet is a CTO. They can code. They have degrees. And didn't go to the conference to tell you any of that. Booth people, janitors, everyone. You'll have a better conference experience. So anyway, I hope you do continue to introduce yourself to people at the conference. But if you think about a regular work day, how much time do you actually spend interacting with people? Probably a lot. How many of you think you spend 20% of the time interacting with people? Yeah, yeah. Let's say 50% of the time. Or less, if that makes sense, yeah. 75%. <laughs> Cool. And all the time? Are there any managers in the room? Or like product owners? Sorry if I, you're a product owner. I just, they go to a lot of meetings at my work. OK, cool. <laughs> cool. But yeah, you know, we're interacting with people all the time in ways we don't even think about. Almost every time we write code, actually, we're interacting with people because more code, your code is probably going to be read more than you write it. But in all the meetings, in writing documentation, in reviewing pull requests, in naming variables, in error messages, in working with PMs, designers, clients, interviewing candidates, these are all ways that we interact with people. Why is this the problem if we don't do this well? Why do we think of these things as being soft skills and hard skills being the important ones? Soft skills kind of being like something you can have, but you know, it's not really that important. Tom DeMarco in his book Peopleware, which is a little bit dated now, but still very relevant, he talks about the human side of programming. And he says this, the major problems of our work are not so much technological in nature as sociological. And then for this book, he surveyed a lot of projects that had failed, software projects. And he says, for the overwhelming majority of the bankrupt projects we studied, there was not one single technological issue to explain the failure. We see this again. This is from the Developer Insights report. Uh, why software projects fail? Um, a big survey as well. And a lot of these things are communication, changing or poorly documented requirements. Poor team or organizational management, developer churn and loss of key talent. And these are all communication things. Again, in a Google study uh, where they looked over two years at over 180 teams to understand what made a high-performing team. The one thing that all high-performing teams had in common 
is that there was a high level of psychological trust. People felt like they could make mistakes and not be called out or be thought of as being stupid. They, they felt like they could take risks. And that's so important because uh, everything that we do in programming is kind of a failure. Like in your day-to-day -day work, you're probably failing all the time. You're writing code that doesn't work. You're developing systems. You're trying to make them work. You probably go through a lot of roadblocks. You have bugs. We experience near constant failure. And so here's an example of how we can adjust our interactions. Um, this is something that I personally had to work on. You're reviewing a pull request and notice that someone has written code that looks wrong. What do you do? If you would like to tell, leave a comment telling them they're wrong, and probably also stupid, turn to page 35. If you would like to explain why you would do this another way, turn to page 10. If you would like to understand more about the context of their change, turn to page 59. And so this is one scenario where our response, the way that we address the situation, that's a choice that we're making that defines our character. Because we can choose to have all our interactions with more empathy. And that is a learnable skill. It involves looking at somebody, thinking about their perspective before reacting in an argument to seeking first to understand and to see their perspective. <coughs> and in being more empathetic, we can adjust the way that we interact with each other. We can prevent each other from feeling stupid a lot of the time. Right? How many times have you used an API or something and you've had this like strange error message and you don't know what it means and you feel like an idiot and you're confused and it's really just that the error message sucked. It's not that you're an idiot. It's just it didn't tell you what was wrong. And so in everything that we do, we can think about this. You know, it's empathy when you're throwing error messages that means something. When you're telling someone um, that things, you know, that this is what they should be doing instead. It's empathy when you're giving people options. How many times have you misspelled something in Git and you're like so happy when it's like, did you mean Git checkout and not Git C misspelled checkout, right? Kathy Sierra says that in one of her talks, if you want them to RTFM, make a better FM, which I love. <laughs> um, and on the topic of not making people feel stupid. So congratulations. One of the initiatives uh, that you've worked on has taken off and is really successful. What are you thinking? If you think it's probably due to luck, happenstance, other people, anything except your skills and abilities, turn to page 10. But if you think it was probably because you put in hard work and you're actually good at what you do, turn to page nine. And a lot of you might be familiar with imposter syndrome. That's the first option here. That's the page 10. And it's non-gendered experience. Everybody feels it. Over 70% of people feel it at some point in their life. And imposter syndrome, can be debilitating. Um, a lot of uh, pop famous people, famous people, a lot of people have uh, come out and talked about their uh, experiences with imposter syndrome. Sheryl Sandberg as well. She says, every time I took a test, I was sure it had gone badly. And every time I didn't embarrass myself or even excelled, I believed that I had fooled everyone yet again and that one day soon the jig would be up. Right now, I feel like I should make you put up your hand if you're experiencing imposter syndrome or have in the last week, but I think that would be really mean, so I won't do it. Don't put up your hands. <laughs> but this is the thing, is that everything in our industry is figureoutable. If you ask the right questions, if you sit and try enough, if you work it out. But the problem with imposter syndrome is it can be so debilitating. If you don't think that you're smart enough to get to the answer, then you might not get to the answer because you might just lose willpower in the middle. Um, and so I think it's really important uh, to actually address this by thinking about it more like this. This is from Alicia Liu's a great Medium article called uh, Overcoming Imposter Syndrome. And she talks about imposter syndrome being like the left side of this. There's what you know and what everybody else knows. And you basically feel like everybody else knows everything you know and a whole lot more. But really, the reality of it is more like the right side. You know, there's the things that you know, there's the things that other people know, and you have an overlap. And this goes back to everybody having something to teach you and you being able to teach something to everybody else. Nobody is perfect. Another great story is of this. This is Mike Cannon Brooks, the CEO of an Australian company called Atlassian, who you might know from Trello or Jira. And he started this company straight out of uh, university. He hadn't had a job before. He founded this company with his co-founder. And the company is, is pretty successful. And so he's been in a lot of situations where he didn't know what he was doing. For example, he had to hire an HR manager, but he had never worked in a company, so he had no idea what an HR manager should do. But he talks about this. 
He says, I attended board meetings in a t-shirt surrounded by suits, and acronyms are flying around. Feeling like a five-year-old as I surreptitiously write down things in my notebook so that I can look them up on Wikipedia later. And uh, maybe some of you are doing this at the conference, actually. Like, <laughs> going, God, I really need to know what all those things people are talking about are. Let me write them down. There's nothing wrong with this. There's nothing wrong with actually being out of our depth. It's not an imposter syndrome thing. You can be there. The thing about this is that, so I used to work at Atlassian, disclaimer, and I spent almost five years there. And the fact that the CEOs didn't have preconceived notions of what the company should be like meant that it had a really unique culture. It was an incredible place to work. And that's the thing. That's what's so great about being a novice. So even if you are new at something, it lets you ask those questions that haven't been asked before. Why do we do this? Why are we doing this? Why is this done this way? And, or approach problems in ways others haven't thought of. And sometimes if we have an imposter syndrome, it really prevents us from asking those questions. I was on a project where we were, we were rewriting a code base. And I, for months, I was just wondering why we were doing this rewrite. But I just didn't feel like I could ask anyone that because it seemed like such a stupid question. Like, what is the point of this project? And so I eventually mustered up the courage to ask people, what are we doing this for? And nobody could remember. It had just started so long ago. Nobody could remember the reason why we were doing this. Uh, so it still might have been the right decision, but like, if you don't have those people to come there and challenge your view, then you're in a place where you're just doing things because it's the way you've always done them. And that's why being a novice and being confident in your position and asking great questions is amazing. In conclusion, and if there's one thing that I want you to take away from this talk, it's this. That the choices that you make aren't part of your life. They are your life. And that you can define your own values and definition of success. And you should ask the dumb questions. Realize that you can change things. And don't be afraid to forge paths with, uncon uh, with unconventional choices. Because unlike the Choose Your Own Adventure book series, if you make a choice and it turns out not to be the right one, it rarely ends up like this. Thank you. So thank you so much for attending. If any of this resonated with you or you have some questions, I will be here and at the conference until Friday. Thank you so much for coming and please enjoy the rest of your conference, attend uh, your conference experience. Don't be afraid to introduce yourself to the person next to you. <laughs>